Hi, and welcome to part two of Risk and Return from Chapter 8. So, a couple of researchers put together um, historic returns on a portfolio that included U.S. stocks as well as stocks from 18 other countries. For the 111-year period, U.S. stocks produced an average return of 9.3% and a standard deviation of 20.2%. However, a globally diversified portfolio had an average return of 8.5%, which is lower, and a standard deviation of 17.7%, which shows less volatility in the dispersion of returns. So because the average returns are different, we have to use the standard devi uh, we have to use the coefficient of variation by dividing the standard deviation by the actual annual returns. So this produced a global diversified portfolio uh, coefficient variation of 2.08, which is slightly lower than the 2.17 coefficient of variation reported from the U.S. stocks in Table 5. So showing that the, uh, investing in the diversified international portfolio was less risky than the U.S. stocks, thereby proving that concept. Okay. Uh, risk and return. Let's talk now about the capital asset pricing model, known as CAPM. Now, this is this capital asset pricing model is something that you will see in um, other classes. Specifically, if you're going to take more finance classes, this is reiterated in investments, capital markets, financial engineering, uh, mergers and acquisitions. So, this is a um, a concept that you're likely to see again if you're studying finance, and because it's a very prominent theory. And what it does is it, it makes a link with the, um, between risk and return for all assets. So it quantifies the relationship between risk and return, and it measures how much additional return an investor should expect from taking on additional risk. Okay, so let's talk about some risk. Okay, total risk is the combination of a security's non-versifiable and diversifiable risk. So non-diversifiable risk are things that you can't improve upon by buying more, putting more stocks in the portfolio. And diversifiable risk are things that you can um, reduce the risk by diversifying the portfolio. So for example, um, if there's specific industry risk, having a diversifiable portfolio will reduce that. If there's a specific business or financial risk of a company, a diversifiable portfolio will reduce that. But non-diversifiable risk would be things related to the general market in total, which affects all stocks that you can't diversify away from. So we would define the first of diversifiable risk as a portion of an asset's risk that is attributed to firm-specific random causes that can be eliminated through diversifying and is sometimes also called unsystematic risk. Uh, the non-diversifiable risk is a relevant portion of risk that attributed to the market factors that affect all firms, such as changes in interest rates, war, um, uh, ec other economic factors that can be that cannot be eliminated by adding more stocks to your portfolio. So we call this uh, systematic risk because it's systemic. So now investors can easily create a portfolio that will eliminate virtually all diversifiable risks. The only relevant risk for us to measure is non-diversifiable risk. So here's a classic chart where if you only have one stock, you're going to have the total amount of risk. You're going to have the non-diversifiable and, diverse, and the diversifiable risks. So you have the highest amount of risk with one stock. Now as you add four stocks, having a total of five stocks, this diversifiable risk goes down get to 10 stocks, that risk goes down. And you notice here that diversifiable risk is the risk that's being reduced, not the non-diversifiable risk stays pretty constant. So if you get up to 25 stocks in your portfolio, you've eliminated most of the diversifiable risk and you're only left with the non-diversifiable risk. Okay, so let's talk beta coefficient. So symbol is a small b, sometimes written in a fancy script. Uh, is a, a relative measure of non-diversifiable risk. So we use beta to, to measure this risk. And so an index of degree of movement of an asset's return in response to a change in the market return. So an asset's historical returns are used um, in finding an asset's beta coefficient. So the beta coefficient for the entire stock market is a one. And the, and the betas are viewed in relationship to the market beta of one. So if your stock has the same risks as the market, it will have a beta of one. So a market return is the risk um, on the market portfolio for all traded securities. So we, we can kind of look at the risk. That would be the um, 
the non-diversifiable risk. Okay, so here is a beta, uh, a chart where we're, we're putting beta down. So here we have the asset return and the market return. And you can see that um, with a beta, so I'm sorry, this is asset uh, characteristic line R for asset R, and here's a characteristic line for asset S. So we can measure the, the slope, which would be the beta. So here the slope, the beta is 1.3, and here the beta is 0.8. So you can see that the, the stock with the higher beta is going to have um, higher market returns in relationship to higher asset returns in relationship to the market returns, and the stock with the beta less than one will have lower returns compared to the market. Okay, so let's look at it this way. Uh, so look at the betas that move in the same direction as the market. So we could have 0.5, 1, and 2. So a beta of 2 means it's twice, it moves twice as much as the market. So if the market went up 10%, a, beta, a stock with a beta of 2 would go up 20%. Now, if a stock had a beta of 1 and the stock market moved up 10%, this stock would theoretically only move up 10% as well. And if a stock had a beta of 0.5, if the stock market moved up 10%, this stock would only move up 5% or half of the response rate. Now, betas can be negative, and betas can be any really any number. Uh, however, most betas are between negative two and positive two, uh, which is different than the correlation scale, which is positive one to negative one. So betas can be outside that scale. Now, if, um, if, it, if it moves in the opposite direction and the stock market has a, um, an increase of 10%, a beta of negative five will only, uh, in, will only will decrease 5%. If the beta is a negative one and the market goes up 10%, this stock's beta will go down 10%. And if, a mar if this has a, a beta, a stock has a beta of negative two, if the market goes up 10%, this stock will go down 20% because it moves in the opposite direction. Here are some betas of some stocks as of May 2013. So you can see some, some stocks have a lower beta and some stocks have a higher beta, um, depending on their relationship to how their stock price moves over time in relationship to the market. Okay, so risk and return using, you know, with continuing this ca capital asset price model idea. So first thing we wanna do is calculate um, a weighted beta portfolio. So the beta of a portfolio. So what we wanna do is sort of calculate a weighted beta for a portfolio. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the weight of each stock. So say there were three stocks, 25%, uh, 50% and 25%, and we times it by the beta, say one, two, and a beta of three, and we add those relation, those together and we get what would be the beta of the portfolio. So it's nothing more than the weighted average of the betas in the portfolio. Now, um, so here, let's look at this example. The portfolio, here's a portion or percentage of the portfolio. So asset one is 10%, asset two is 30%, asset three is 20%, asset four is 20%, asset five is 20%. Add these together, you get 100%. And here are the betas for each of the assets. Uh, that's portfolio V. Portfolio W, we have a 10, 10, 20, 10, and 50% uh, proportions for each stock. And then here are the betas accordingly. Now, if we're gonna calculate the weighted beta, we take, if you see here, 10% times 165, 10% times 165, I'm gonna add that to 30% times one, 20% times 130, 20% times 110, 20% times 125, and you see that all laid out here. So we're gonna make these calculations, add those results together, and we get a weighted beta portfolio of 1.2 for the V portfolio, and the W portfolio has a weighted beta of 0.91. So B would be, B to the V would be more riskier than B to the W. Now, using the beta coefficient to, uh, to measure non-diversifiable risk, that's where the capital asset pricing model comes into effect. So here is the equation where, where R to the J is the required rate of return. R to the F is the risk-free. And we're gonna add that to the beta coefficient risk for the asset times the market return minus the risk-free rate. 
So what we're basically doing here is we're subtracting out the risk-free rate because we don't want to magnify it. We just want to magnify the remainder, which is um, the, the market return. So we magnify that, but then we add the non-magnified risk-free rate back to get the required risk of the portfolio. So, so we can divide this in two parts. The risk-free rate, uh, RF, which is usually stated as the uh, three-month treasury bill and the risk premium. So the risk premium is this risk, the market risk minus the risk-free rate. So if we take the, the, um, the market risk and we subtract out the risk-free rate, what we're calculating is the risk premium. Um, it's sometimes called the market risk premium because it, it represents the premium the investor is taking above the, the risk-free rate. Okay, so for, for investment, stocks have a return of 9.3% minus a risk premium of 3.9 and we get a market return of 5.4 or the market premium the market risk premium and for bonds it's 1.1 so this is basically taking out the risk free rate this is the actual return above what you could get with zero risk so this is why we want to look at this risk premium because this is our return that's directly in relationship to our risks okay so if we so for a benjamin corporation this is a growing computer software developer which is determined the required rate of return on asset Z has a beta of 1.5. The risk-free rate is 7%. The market return is 11%. So by subtracting, um, by substituting B to the Z as 1.5 and RF is 7, RM is 11%. So we're just translating the, the, the um, numbers here into the ratio, into the variables. We could calculate that um, 1.5 times 11 minus 7 which is 4% and then we times 1.5 we get 6% add back the risk free rate of 7% we get a required return of 13%. So all things being equal the higher the beta the higher the required rate of return and the lower the beta the lower the required rate of return and since beta is a measure of risk that makes sense. Okay so the, the security market line is a graphical way to look at the capital price at capital asset pricing model. So as a graph, we can reflect the required return uh, in the marketplace for each level of non-diversifiable risk. So it reflects the required return in the marketplace for each level of beta, or what we call non-diversifiable risk. So on the graph, beta is plotted on the x-axis and returns are, are plotted on the y-axis. So here's a graph. So here are the returns and here are the beta. So if we have a beta of one, that means the market return is, is 11% for beta of one, so that's a market return. If the risk-free rate is seven, the difference between the market return and the risk-free rate is the market risk premium of 4%. So we have a market risk premium of 4%. Now, if we go to a beta of 1.5, we're gonna take that 4% and multiply it by 1.5 to get 6%. So 4% times 1.5, we get our 6%, and that's our new risk premium. So we add that uh, to the line and then our new required re return for for asset Z is 13 percent now what if there's an inflation shift so if there's a, a three there's a three point three percentage increase in inflation we would go from a risk-free rate of seven percent to ten percent and all along the market um, security market line here we see a three percent increase evenly between the betas so beta of one we already know uh, a beta of one was 11%, um, but add 3% to that, and now becomes 14%. And the reason they're, they're steady parallel lines is because we don't magnify risk-free rate. So you saw in the capital asset pr pricing model up here that we're not, we're subtracting out risk-free here, we're not magnifying it by beta, and we add it back later. So it makes sense that if inflation goes up, there's a shift of inflation, it shifts all of the market line up 3%. So a, you know, a 1.5 beta is going to be the 13% we had calculated, but now it's going to be 16% because we're adding the 3% inflation on top. So you can see how inflation is not magnified in calculating the capital asset pricing model. However, if we're talking about risk aversion and we're going to look at you know, so we have our original model where we had a 7% risk-free rate and that generated a market risk of 4% or 11% market return. 
However, now if we're going to look at the market return at 14%, which means that at a 14% market return, we're going to have a bigger, this bar here means a bigger risk premium. So the new market risk premium would be 7%. So here it was 4%. And if we're looking at a, a shift in risk, meaning that we need more compensation for risk, that's going to go to a 7%. So when we magnify the 7% by 1.5, we're going to move, we're going to, 1.5 times 7 is going to be 3.5%. So now we're gonna we're gonna move from our 14%, add three and a half percent to it. Now we get to 17.5%. So you see how the lines are diverging here, the, because we are um, we are using beta to increase the risk the market risk premium. As beta goes up, the the amount of return you need is greater. What you won't see in when we look at risk free rate because it's not being magnified. But since um, risk premium does get magnified by beta as beta goes up we're going to see we're going to need a, a bigger and bigger required return to compensate for the new risk okay so let's continue so the capital asset pricing model on historical data which means the the betas may not may or may not actually reflect the future variables of returns because it's based on what's happened in the past so past returns are not a hundred percent guarantee of future returns Therefore, the required return specified by the model should be used only as a rough approximation. So the capital asset price model assumes markets are efficient. Um, all, uh, although the perfect world, in the perfect world of efficient markets, that appears a little, a little bit unrealistic because markets are not perfect. They have bubbles, they have crashes. So studies have provided support for the existence of um, an expectational theory described by the capital asset pricing model in active markets. But in the real world, there are other factors that can make the capital asset pricing model not as accurate. However, it is the most accurate model we have for measuring risk in relationship to market returns. Okay, so we're done with this chapter and our learning in our learning goals, we understand the meaning and the fundamentals of risk return and risk preferences that we talked about. We described a procedure for assessing and measuring risk of a single asset. So we looked at portfolios of, um, and portfolios of assets. So we looked at scenario and analysis, probability distributions, um, standard deviations, coefficient of variations used to measure risk. We talked about measuring of return and standard deviation for a portfolio and the concept of correlation between the movement of individual assets inside of a portfolio. We get into understanding of risk return characteristics in the portfolio in terms of correlation and its impact of diversification and, and, and also the impact of international assets inside a portfolio. We talked about the two types of risk, the um, diversifiable and non-diversifiable and the, um, the role beta plays in measuring the relevant risk for both a security and a portfolio. And we explained what the capital asset, asset pricing model is in the relationship between the security market line and the major forces affecting the security market line, which would be inflation and, and risk uh, aversion. Okay, so now that we're done with this, you wanna move on and start looking at the spreadsheet exercise for chapter eight. And you also wanna complete the homework exercises for chapter eight. Thank you and I'll talk to you soon.